Welcome and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined with Dick Evans, the photographer on this book, and Kathy Chin Leong, who is the writer on this book. And we are showcasing their be beautiful book on San Francisco's Chinatown. Welcome, everyone. I'm Dave Christensen, director of the Harvey Milk Photo Center in San Francisco. The Harvey Milk Photo Center is located at the top of DeBoas Park at 50 Scott Street in San Francisco and is part of the San Francisco Recreation and Parks Department. We are celebrating over 75 years in San Francisco, and we have the wettest, the largest wet darkroom in operations in the United States. Unfortunately, we're currently closed due to the pandemic and hope to open possibly in the summer of 2021. We offer wonderful, engaging online virtual photography courses, workshops, as well as educational webinars, lectures, and galleries, which we hope you check out and enjoy. We have also just recently formed our new nonprofit, the Friends of the Harvey Milk Photo Center, and we trust you will help support this nonprofit in our community with your generous donations. Your donations will directly support our center with needed supplies, staffing, programming as we move into the future. Our mission is to support our entire community through these enriching educational programs, classes, and offerings. Please check out our website. And should you have comments or questions, We'd be happy to hear from you at harveymilkphotocenter at gmail.com. I'd like to talk about the book a little bit. The Chinatown book is the third in a series of contemporary documentary photography books by San Francisco resident and photographer Dick Evans. Following his initial book of 2014 of the Haight-Ashbury and his 2017 award-winning book on the mission, which is fantastic, his approach in each case has been to develop an in-depth understanding of each neighborhood through close collaboration with leading nonprofits, community organizations, artists, and local businesses. In this book, he collaborates with freelance writer, Kathy Chin Leong, who has conducted over a hundred interviews in the course of writing the text, the captions and sidebar notes and stories that provide context to these beautiful images and neighborhoods history, traditions, celebrations, the businesses, the nonprofits, and the many colorful residents that make up Chinatown. I should note that all revenue from the book sales will be donated to collaborating nonprofit organizations. Dick Evans is a San Francisco-based photographer with an interest in documenting the colorful and rapidly changing neighborhoods of our city. Born into a ranching family in Eugene, Oregon, he graduated as an engineer from Oregon State University and, and subsequently obtained a master's in management from Stanford. He has spent a 50 year career in global metal sector, living in five countries with multiple locations in Africa, Europe, and North America. It was during these travels that he developed an appreciation for the diversity and richness of different cultures, both global and local and an interest in documentary photography. Kathy Chin Leong is an award-winning journalist with articles published in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, National Geographic Books, Sunset Magazine, and many other newspapers and magazines. As a second generation American born Chinese, she grew up in San Francisco's Sunset District and has spent nearly every weekend in Chinatown visiting her grandmother and helping her mother shop for groceries. While she was traveling the globe to Lebanon, France, Thailand, and Canada, rediscovering her Chinatown roots through collaboration on this book has been a journey of a lifetime. Kathy lives in Sunnyvale, California with her devoted husband, Frank Leong Jr. and is the proud mother of two grown children, Gwendolyn and Erin. I wish to remind our audience today to please use the Q&A function for any questions that we will try to answer at the end of this presentation today. Please address your questions to either Dick or Kathy or myself, and then type your question. And now I'm proud to present Dick Evans and Kathy Chin Leon. Okay, very good. Thanks very much, Dave. And, You're very welcome. Uh, and uh, thank you to both you personally and to the Harvey Milk Center, which is a wonderful institution. And I hope you're soon back open. Uh, my wife and I have visited there numerous times before the shutdown. 
We All miss right. everyone coming and visiting <laughs> us. It's just, um, it's such a great place for community. It really right. is. So we're so, hoping it will be soon. So hang in there. <laughs> we will. Uh, we will. We're all hanging in there, right? Right. Uh, now, before we start our narrated slideshow and some of the background stories, uh, we thought it might be uh, interesting to play a short trailer uh, that was prepared. It's about two minutes, and it gives you a good synopsis of what's in the book. Since this is uh, quite a knowledgeable audience about photography, uh, David suggested, and I thought it was a great idea, that I give uh, a couple comments about some of the maybe more technical aspects uh, of the photography and a little bit about the project itself. Uh, so a lot of people ask, uh, you know, what camera do you use? What lens do you use? Uh, so take that right at the top. Uh, the images in this book were shot with uh, Sony a7 mirrorless camera, uh, both a R3 and an R4 uh, have both camera bodies and uh, use them interchangeably. And for lenses, I uh, used everything from a fisheye lens, lens for some of the uh, like internal uh, shop pictures and so on to a modest uh, telephoto and everything in between. Uh, the one lens that I found to be the real workhorse and exceptionally useful is a Zeiss uh, f 2.8 24-70 zoom, uh, which hits at mid-range and is uh, was used for probably over half of the photos that are in the book. Uh, also, uh, I get asked as well about uh, uh, how do you get the color saturation and uh, you know avoid some of the reflections and so on. Um, I use a circular polarizer on virtually all of my outdoor shots. Uh, and I find it to be really helpful on murals, for example, because most murals are coated uh, with a veneer to protect them. And that gives you a sheen or a reflection. And by having circular polarizer, you can cut through that and really see the colors. Uh, of course, it's also quite useful on windows where you might have reflections. And of course, it's very good on skies to give you the uh, definition and saturation. Uh, I shot over 5,000 images. I think it's close to 6,000. We used uh, a little over 200 of the images in the book itself. Another two or 300 that we used in the website and some of our other promotion materials and the trailer that you've just seen. Um, we requested written information from all of our subjects when it was an individual shot or you know very clear 
identity, um, small group or, or a close up shot of someone's face. Uh, and then we offered everyone who is portrayed in the book and every organization a free copy of the book. Uh, so that was part of our agreement in terms of getting their permission. Uh, and I think it was a good investment because we found many, uh, when they did finally receive the free book, uh, then would go back out and buy uh, several copies for family and friends. Uh, as Dave mentioned, the project was a nonprofit project. Uh, all the revenue goes to our, our partner, the Chinese Culture Center, uh, and also to the nonprofit publisher, Heyday Books of Berkeley. And in that spirit, we did not pay royalties uh, uh, or did not pay for use of uh, intellectual property. And we explained this up front to people. Uh, we only had one person out of over 100 uh, refused to have their work or their image in the book. It actually was a muralist who, who chose not to have his uh, mural uh, in the book. Uh, and he wasn't even from Chinatown. So <laughs> it, it, uh, and we easily had other material. Uh, the image that you see right here is not in the book. And I put it up uh, because it, it reminded me of a very good lesson which I learned once in the mission book and should have taken full heed of and uh, learned again here. Uh, this uh, young girl who's about five years old was at the uh, Miss Chinatown USA pageant. And I just love the, you know, the costume, the look. She's with some older uh, uh, girls, uh, sort of teenage level. And I really love this image and had planned to use it uh, in the book and in the promotion and perhaps even as uh, front or back cover. Uh, unfortunately, I assume we could easily go back and find her identity. And uh, as things developed, when we went back, uh, uh, we could not, uh, now we could have maybe tried a bit harder. And, and as we did in the mission book, when we couldn't find the identity, we actually went all over the mission posting pictures uh, and then finally got someone to call and we identified <laughs> that person. But the, the reason I just show it here is good lesson for the project itself. Whenever you're doing photography that you hope to publish and are going to need permission for, get it right away. <laughs> I try to do it most of the time, but this time I slipped up and got onto something else and I really wish I had. So uh, we're still hoping maybe somebody will come forward because uh, we've showed this on a couple slideshows and if if we are able to find out, which is difficult now with COVID, uh, but if we were, we would put it in the next edition. So let's move on to the book itself. Uh, the image that you see here, uh, if you've been to Chinatown, it's probably one that you recognize. It's Grand Avenue looking north uh, from about midway through uh, Chinatown. Uh, and you see the red lanterns and of course the uh, uh, Chinese uh, script uh, and the, some of the shops there on Grand Avenue. Uh, Grand Avenue of course is, is the oldest or one of the oldest streets in San Francisco. Uh, and, and many people don't realize that, uh, but it goes back a long, a long way and it runs right through the center of Chinatown. Uh, but most of us think of this as being historic Chinatown. Uh, and initially, before I dug into this a bit more, I assumed that this came with Chinatown when it was first founded uh, in the 1800s, but uh, found out later, of course, that's not true. Uh, the initial Chinatown settlement in this same location was actually, uh, you know, low rise, low rent, uh, uh, almost a shanty town uh, or uh, ethnic ghetto. Uh, and it wasn't until about 50 years later after the founding of Chinatown uh, when the 1906 earthquake hit leveled much of, of uh, downtown San Francisco, including Chinatown. Uh, and then the fires, uh, of course, destroyed uh, much of what was not leveled. Uh, that Chinatown was rebuilt um, 
And initially the city fathers wanted to take this opportunity to try to move uh, the Chinese residents out to the uh, outlands of San Francisco uh, and to sort of reclaim this prime real estate right in the center of the city. Uh, there was pushback from the residents and, and eventually a settlement reached where they agreed to have Chinatown rebuilt as uh, essentially a tourist attraction as well as a residential center. Uh, and that's where this uh, uh, now famous architecture that we see this, what was called quote, oriental architecture, uh, built mainly by Caucasian uh, builders and architects who uh, copied photographs and pictures with some uh, uh, Chinese architect input. Uh, so that's why you have this uh, very elaborate, colorful uh, type of architecture in Chinatown. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that we used one of these facades to be the cover of the book uh, because it is so colorful and so typical of Chinatown. Uh, this is a, a fairly famous building that at one time housed the Four Seas restaurant, uh, long since closed, but uh, uh, a quite a well-known restaurant. Uh, and today the sign for the Four Seas is still there on the restaurant. Uh, but inside is Chinatown's uh, Michelin rated, uh, uh, Michelin star rated restaurant, Mr. Jews, uh, quite a new and a very excellent uh, restaurant. Uh, other typical aspects of the architecture you see here, uh, we've captured two of them in one. Uh, one is the historic uh, street lights that you see, uh, which line all of Grant Avenue. And then you see the pagoda rooftops. And again, that was part of the architectural effort uh, post earthquake uh, to build something that would attract tourism uh, to Chinatown. When the uh, immigrants came in the mid 1800s for the gold rush, um, it was, uh, uh, was not an easy immigration. Uh, there was a backlash to so many people flooding in. And uh, as you see in this next image, uh, uh, the Chinese immigrants uh, were registered, were identified, they were uh, discriminated against, they were limited as to where they could live, what they could do as work. Uh, they, uh, of course, many of them went to the gold mining area, but even there they were limited on whether they could state claims or not. Um, and uh, that is, I think, the beginning of Chinatown developing such a resilience that it still has today. Uh, so services, goods, stores, uh, they had to be self-sufficient. And uh, I think that early discrimination uh, really encouraged the self-sufficiency that uh, you still see today exhibited in a number of ways. Uh, the next slide here is uh, from a set of engravings. There were hundreds, if not thousands of these engravings on the wooden walls and the uh, railings of the buildings in which the Chinese were kept when they first came to the US uh, on Angel Island. Uh, so there's been a, a historical uh, resurrection project a few years ago uh, to identify all of these uh, writings, names, dates that had been carved into the wood. Uh, this is one that I think is especially poignant. And if you think about it, you look at the bottom, it's written in 1939, so this is something that went on for decades. Uh, but let me just read it because I think it's so, so powerful. Everybody's got a number. I think my number is 80340. They would put your number on the blackboard and you know that you have to go to interrogation or a health checkup. They did not use names. On the day that they let you go, your number is on the blackboard and it says, San Francisco. So uh, this just reminds us of how long the discrimination uh, continued. And it went on beyond 1939. Uh, and the final 
vestiges really carried into even the 50s and 60s uh, in terms of uh, laws, regulations, and overt and, and subtle discrimination. Uh, but of course, Chinatown has evolved since uh, uh, even the 1950s and 60s, and there are still uh, social justice issues that get prominent attention. Uh, this is one that you might recognize. It's uh, a bronze statue that's in the center of Portsmouth Square now, about 10 feet tall. And uh, you can see behind it's the financial center in Transamerica uh, to the east. Uh, but this statue is a replica of the 50 foot wood paper cardboard statue that was in Tiananmen Square in, 18, in 1989. Uh, you may recall uh, if you've seen the films or watched it even at that time that the students had built that statue uh, and it's called the goddess of democracy. There's another statue in Chinatown too, even a little more current, but it also harkens back to a very historical uh, injustice. And this is uh, one called the comfort women. These were the young girls and young women who were enslaved by the Japanese uh, government and military to be prostitutes for uh, the army, the Japanese army during World War II. And you see three young women here. Uh, one represents Chinese, one Filipino, uh, and the other one Korean, who were uh, the ethnicities who were uh, enslaved in that prostitution uh, for the soldiers. Uh, this one uh, behind it, by the way, you see the Bank of America building. Uh, so it's right there next to uh, California Street. Uh, it's in St. Mary's Square. Uh, this one, uh, when it went up, created quite a fuss and it even resulted in uh, San Francisco and Osaka breaking off their sister city relationship uh, hopefully that will come back together at, at some point. Um, so as you can see, the history of Chinatown, just from that brief summary, has been a history of resilience and survival uh, over 170 years. Uh, and there are examples all throughout that period of, of, of that being the case. But it's also been a period of, of a lot of celebration and traditions that go with it. Uh, and during the course of uh, doing this book, um, Kathy Chin Leong, who was uh, my partner in doing it, uh, interviewed over 100 people, as Dave mentioned. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy now for some comments, and she'll come back later with a lot more. Kathy? Hello, everybody. In this mural, this is um, a mural created by James Leong. It was commissioned in 1952, and it covers 100 years of Chinese in America. It starts in the, on the left, and it goes all the way to the right, as you can see the progression of the Chinese um, who first came to America, the things that they had endured, and how they um, assimilated um, towards the end of the, um, the middle of the 20th century. What was really interesting was that after this mural was commissioned, the Chinese community uh, rejected it. They hated it because they felt it reinforced stereotypes of Chinese, even though it's historically accurate. Now, this criticism hurt the painter so much that James Leong fled to, to Europe and he kept his career thriving there in Europe for the remainder of his career. Later on, this seven panel mural, which was created with egg tempera paint, it was uh, lost. It was later recovered and found in a Chinatown rec room where parts of it were used for a ping pong table. Now it is on permanent display at the Chinese Historical Society of America. And in the year 2000, James Lee Ong, who was then retired living in Seattle, he was invited back to retouch the mural. And this time he was welcomed back with honor. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, if we could just go back to that mural, I just want to make a comment from a photography standpoint. Uh, again, because we have a very high degree of expertise, I, I would guess, in this audience. Uh, so with, you, with a mural like this, which is uh, you know five or six times wider than it is high, 
obviously you have a big problem of distortion if you try to take that shot. Uh, so uh, what I did on this one is, is I took uh, probably six separate images uh, and, uh, you know, from exactly the same distance uh, and same settings on the camera. And then we stitched those together so that you get the uh, actual real dimension so that you can see it as a, a rectangle here. Uh, so uh, the shared uh, history uh, in Chinatown, of course, uh, goes hand in hand with the shared culture. And one of the biggest cultural events of the year is the Lunar New Year celebration. And, and of course, that's coming up again soon. I think it's February 12th this year. Uh, unfortunately, this year due to COVID, there will not be a parade and there'll be a much scaled down uh, celebration, which is, is just terrible because it's a really great event. Um, it had, has become a, a destination tourism event uh, and capped by the parade is now attended by hundreds of thousands of people annually under normal circumstances. Uh, now, of course, dragons and lions abound, as you see here, in terms of a lion dancer and in front of a dragon. Uh, here you see an overhead shot going under the Kearney Street Bridge of uh, a dragon uh, in the parade. Uh, here is uh, next is a shot of some of the parade goers. Uh, these are actually elementary school students, uh, I assume seventh or eighth graders from West Portal Elementary School. And for a number of years, they have been performing as stilt walkers in costume at this at the parade. Uh, so they traverse the entire mile plus of the parade route on stilts and in these costumes. Uh, this is pre-parade uh, down on Market Street where they stage all of the parade groups. And again, as a photography hint, if you want to photograph the parade, uh, it's great to get shots of the parade in process, but it's even better uh, to go an hour or hour and a half early and go down to the staging areas where you can really get close-up shots like this, talk to the people, learn all about it, uh, and uh, it's a great place to get photographs uh, of the participants. I think we have another one. Uh, nope, we're moving on to the Moon Festival here. Um, another big event is the Moon Festival uh, held in the fall. Uh, the very photogenic woman on the left uh, is Maggie Wong. She has been the Moon Festival goddess for the last 20 years. Uh, she also helped us with the book I might mention. She was one of the people uh, that worked with us to take us around, uh, meet people, make introductions, make arrangements to, to uh, uh, visit shops and, and uh, uh, attend events and, and uh, get behind the scenes for some of our uh, shots. But the Moon Festival is also a great, uh, uh, a great event in the fall. And again, another terrific uh, photography opportunity. Today, if Bruce Lee were alive, he would be 80 years old. And before he came on the scene in the 1970s, Chinese males had no role models. They were cast as houseboys or evil emperors in the media, or white people played Chinese roles with taped eyes speaking broken English in stereotypic accents. So Bruce Lee changed the life of this man, Jeff Chin, pictured on the left. So when Jeff was a boy, he was picked on because he was Chinese. Then one night, after a really difficult day in middle school, he looked at the Bruce Lee poster hanging on his wall in his bedroom, and he felt like the action hero was calling out to him, giving him hope. And he told Bruce Lee he would make him proud. Well, since then, Jeff has become the world's, one of the world's top collectors of Bruce Lee memorabilia, with over 10,000 items, including an original suit he wore in Enter the Dragon. Portions of his collections have traveled the world, including the Smithsonian, Washington, DC. And uh, we in the Bay Area will get a glimpse of his collection. This fall, the Chinese Historical Society of American Museum in Chinatown, they'll be hosting a Life of Bruce Lee exhibition in um, the fall. So keep a lookout for that. Now Chinese uh, Tai Chi 
is a very venerable tradition. Many people are doing it from early morning exercise classes to huge performances. And it's a wonderful exercise for the body, mind, and spirit. Now, during this photography shoot, um, we were able to uh, commemorate worldwide international Tai Chi Day, and we we're able to capture these images on the bridge outside the cultural center leading to Portsmouth Square. Dick was also able to locate a Chinese uh, Tai Chi master, Sifu Xu Fen Zhao. She was willing to demonstrate some of these Tai Chi positions in front of different murals and other landmarks on the streets of Chinatown. Here we are with the Tong family at Chinatown's revered Far East Cafe. At every red egg and ginger party, uh, the baby is celebrated for um, being one month old and you have to have dyed red eggs to represent fertility and a plate of ginger, which represents energy and strength. Now we came just in time in 2019 for um, this baby party. Now the 100 year old cafe Far East Cafe shut its doors on December 31st. So it is a huge loss to the community. However, one thing does remain and that is Chinese New Year. This is my nephew, Tyler, he's 10 years old and he loves Chinese New Year the most because you, you see kids usually get two red envelopes filled with two fresh bills for double happiness. And actually, Chinese will give red envelopes for weddings, birthdays, and any celebration these days. Meanwhile, another tradition is the wedding tea ceremony. But fewer and fewer Chinese couples are honoring it. But Liana and Michael are the exception here. During the wedding, they will present tea to their elders, as you'll see in this next slide. In turn, the parents and grandparents, one couple at a time, will offer them money and jewelry. Now, brides aren't the only ones who receive jewelry. Many times, an older woman will start handing down her heirlooms to her granddaughter, daughter, or daughter-in-law when she feels the time's right. In ancient times, people believed if you wore a gold necklace or jade bracelet, you would be protected from evil spirits. Chinese jewelry is unique in that sense. It's not just ornamental. Many believe it possesses powers and it has been used as money during times of war. I love this mural, which has unfortunately is no longer up, but this scene depicts everyday Chinatown life. Here you see a modern woman pass a traditional tailor shop and she wears a traditional jade bracelet on her wrist, probably from her mother or grandmother. She carries a bag of good luck oranges over her shoulder and a box of bakery treats for a sweet life. Now this is my family with my mom sharing dim sum, um, otherwise known as going to yum cha in common, uh, which is a common memory for American born Chinese like myself. Little plates of chicken feet and steam tripe and gizzards are not exotic, it's just everyday dishes. So here we are in New Asia, one of the few banquet restaurants left. It's temporarily closed um, due to the pandemic and has turned its space into a produce market. But do tell us, um, what is your favorite dim sum? We would love to, to read that on the Q&A or chat. Chinatown is an extremely strong community spirit. Uh, it's uh, ethnically quite uh, homogeneous, uh, you know, mostly uh, people from southern uh, provinces of China, uh, mostly uh, Cantonese speaking, uh, and it's just a very strong uh, community spirit. Uh, and you, you really get that feeling if you ever walk through Portsmouth Square under normal conditions. Now, Portsmouth Square is the original founding location of San Francisco, and it's right in the heart of Chinatown. Uh, and it also serves as sort of the backyard of uh, Chinatown where people come to gather to play cards, uh, to play mahjong, uh, just to talk, to read newspapers, um, sometimes to uh, carry a sign and demonstrate. Uh, but uh, you really get a sense of that spirit when you walk through Portsmouth Square. 
so the prior picture, you saw uh, a group of uh, women playing cards. And what was interesting when I shot this is originally they were sitting outside in the sun uh, playing their card games. And then uh, it was in the spring and we got, uh, uh, you know, just some dark clouds came over and it just started to pour down. And I assumed my photo shooting was over. Uh, so I started to bundle things up and head for the car. Uh, but I noticed the women didn't stop their card game. Uh, they didn't even put down their hands. They kept the hands, they took out their umbrellas, and they moved over under the protection of the uh, gate that goes uh, under the Kearney Street Bridge. And the game continued. Uh, and uh, other groups continued the same way. Uh, and also, you see, uh, again, in the sense of community, there are quite a number of uh, family benevolent associations. Uh, you might, you might even say family or clan benevolent associations that go way back in terms of historically having a purpose of providing uh, help uh, for the immigrants as they came in. I think Kathy's going to comment a bit more on that. But now you'll see uh, these benevolent associations as gathering places. So on a Saturday uh, or Sunday morning, uh, you'll see people playing uh, cards, Chinese checkers, mahjong uh, in these uh, in these buildings. Also, they have newspaper reading rooms, Chinese newspapers, uh, television, uh, other activities. So it's a real uh, community gathering place. And there are, are, are dozens of these benevolent associations uh, all around Chinatown. Uh, another institution of Chinatown is the Miss Chinatown USA pageant. And it is a Miss Chinatown USA, not just San Francisco. Uh, it's open to young women from any Chinatown around the United States. Um, and uh, this is, uh, was a Miss Chinatown of 2019, a young woman named Catherine Wu. Um, and you might ask, why is there a separate Miss Chinatown uh, pageant? And the answer was, for decades, the young women uh, of Chinese descent and from Chinatown were not allowed, not encouraged to participate in Miss America, Miss California uh, pageants. So they were discriminated against. And they started their own uh, pageant as a result. Of course, that's changed now. Uh, and it's, it's obviously open to uh, Chinese uh, participants. Uh, but Miss Chinatown USA has continued as a very uh, strong tradition. Uh, here's Catherine again. And uh, in the prior pictures, you saw her with some school students. And among her other activities, she uh, encourages bilingual education. Uh, and reads in Chinese and in English to elementary students, uh, which was what she was doing in the prior picture. Uh, but also we found she had another talent that we did not expect at all. And that was that she is a international level, Olympic level archer uh, and was very much in fact, looking forward to participating, uh, hoping to participate in the Olympic games in Japan. Um, but of course they were canceled. So uh, that's very unfortunate, but uh, it was quite a surprise uh, for us to learn of that talent. Uh, so we had asked her if we could take some shots of her with her, uh, you can't see it, but it's a USA um, uh, t-shirt, uh, you know, representing the United States with a very elaborate bow, as you see uh, in her hand there. Um, now, not only is the Miss Chinatown USA pageant uh, a representation of self-sufficiency, uh, but there are many others within Chinatown. Uh, this is another, this is the YMCA. Uh, and you see a mural here uh, done by the way by Perseida Eyes uh, a couple decades ago. Uh, but the Chinese were not encouraged or not allowed to use the YMCA's outside of Chinatown. 
uh, and therefore they did what uh, any resilient organization would do. Uh, they organized their own YMCA, which today is still a very successful and, and beloved institution within Chinatown. And one other story worth mentioning, the Chinese hospital. You might ask, why do you have a, a full uh, scale hospital in such a small community? Uh, but again, it was because services were not readily available to the residents and they were discriminated against. Uh, so now you have a, a beautiful modern hospital, uh, which has both Western medicine and uh, some of the historic uh, uh, Chinese medicine practiced as well. Chinatown is the densest neighborhood outside of Manhattan. It's only one fifth of a square mile and has as many as 30,000 inhabitants. So imagine your home is the size of a closet shared with four or more people. So welcome to single renter occupancy or SRO apartments. Here you have no access to washers or dryers. You have to hand wash and hang clothes outside to dry. You share a restroom and kitchen with your neighbors. So when you see something like this, it's not just because they want to do this, they have to do this. We were so blessed to be um, part of uh, Reverend Norman Fong's group. He offered to give us a tour of the SROs. Here he is um, on the day of the photo shoot, a young gal comes up to him and asks him to come to visit her grandmother who's living on the fourth floor and she's too weak to go downstairs. There's no elevators and uh, she is sick and cannot go to the doctor. So he comes and he gives her um, just comfort and a prayer. We were very honored to be there at that moment. Now Chinatown spans generations from old to young. And if you're a teenager on the Dragon Boat Racing Team from Community Youth Center, all your gear and your practice time is free of charge. So thanks to CYC, a nonprofit, the sport is transforming the lives of at-risk kids who might be tempted to join the wrong crowd. When I was young, it was not cool to be Chinese, but I also felt ashamed of my culture. But today things are different. Many Chinese youth are proud of their heritage. Take Yu Han Chen, for instance, only six years old at the time of the shooting, um, she picks up a brush for the first time at a Chinese New Year event, and she finds out she excels at Chinese calligraphy. Now, Tyler Pham, meanwhile, happily samples dragon beard candy. He's making a beard of his own. Now, the dragon beard candy was originally the dessert of ancient Chinese emperors. It's made from a solid block of syrup and hand pulled like taffy to form thousands of threads. Now the tiny uh, dragon beard candy shop has recently closed on Grant Street and I'm hoping one day it'll come back. Now these colorful buildings are not just ornamental, they belong to family associations and there are more than 200 in Chinatown. Back in the 1800s, when you landed in Chinatown, you would look up your association based on your village or your last name and the association would help you secure a job and a place to stay. Now these rooms often feature shrines and note that these are private clubhouses, not open to outsiders. So getting inside to take pictures for this book was extremely rare. The largest of these associations is the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association of America. And it consists of more than 50,000 members in the United States and Canada. Recently, they worked with local officials to block marijuana shops from coming into Chinatown. The largest problem facing the associations today is future leadership because they're headed by elderly men and most sons are not involved and women are not encouraged um, to take leadership. You may recognize this space. This is Cecilia Chang, who recently passed away at 100 years old last October. She was a very famous restaurateur and also referred to as the Julia Child of Chinese cooking. Back in 1968, 
She opened the very first elegant and successful Chinese restaurant called the Mandarin based in Ghirardelli Square. Now she was turned down in Chinatown to open a, um, a restaurant because she was neither Cantonese speaking, um, she spoke Mandarin, and she was also a woman. Later, later her son Philip caught the restaurant bug and he is the co-owner of PF Chang's with restaurants all over the world. Today, Chinese schools, they go back as far as the 1800s. They were erected because immigrant parents feared their children would lose the culture and language of the homeland. At that time, kids learned Cantonese, the language of the Guangdong province where most Chinese are from. But today, children are learning Mandarin, the national language of China. This is Corey Chan. We call him the lion head whisperer. For over 40 years, he has been storing injured lion heads and gives them back their roar. He simply self-taught. He replaces eyelid strings used for blinking. He glues on new fur and he paints over scratches until the lion looks like new. And after the repairs, Corey says, new memories come back to the lion. To many uh, visitors and I think residents as well, uh, Chinatown experience is just not complete unless you stop at a restaurant or a bakery or a food market. Um, I know that in the three year period that uh, I did this book project, I would seldom get out of Chinatown without making a dim sum stop or a bakery stop. There is a, uh, actually a best selling book titled The Woman Who Ate Chinatown, a San Francisco Odyssey, uh, written by the late Shirley Fong Torres, who is uh, uh, Ben Fong Torres's uh, sister, actually. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away a number of years ago. Um, but many people have a favorite establishment. This is a, a very local uh, restaurant. Uh, and it's typical that you see these roasted ducks in the window, as you see here. Um, there are now emerging to be some uh, uh, new modern restaurants, but uh, roasted ducks, I don't think ever will disappear. And I hope they don't because they're one of my favorites. Uh, this is from the new uh, China Live restaurant, which uh, was founded by George Chen and his wife, uh, Cindy. And it's uh, just a, a, a beautiful, large, immaculate facility. Here you see the kitchen at uh, China Live. Uh, so not what you would typically think of, uh, of the small uh, sort of hole in the wall or basement restaurants that, uh, that made uh, Chinatown famous. Here you see giant steamers. Uh, cooking, and my favorite, uh, giant chocolate mousse mixers. I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a restaurant named Mr. Jews. Here you see a shot uh, inside that restaurant. Again, you see the kitchen through the window there. Uh, it's uh, has a Michelin star now, uh, and the chef and founder, Brandon Jew, is uh, quite well known. Uh, here you see uh, the sort of ex exquisite and, uh, uh, you know, very contemporary presentation of uh, their dishes. There are also some uh, younger restaurateurs like uh, this young woman, Kathy Fang, who has won a number of awards and uh, has a restaurant actually not in Chinatown, but in downtown called Fang's. This happy employee works at Mao Li Shinki. It's a business of dried meats and poultry over 100 years old and spans over seven generations. And have you ever had dried salted fish or hangi? This is a very special food memory for me. As a child, when I stayed at my grandmother's SRO, Popo steamed this over rice for breakfast. Coffee crunch cake, anyone? Eastern Bakery is one of only two bakeries in San Francisco uh, that makes this famous confection. The other is in Japantown. So Eastern Bakery is weathering COVID um, because the owner told me that all these years they have saved every penny from the bakery. They never remodeled or spent extra money. And so Mr. Orlando Kwan continues to sell his cakes and treats every single day. This is uh, a produce market on Stockton Street. 
And every day at four o'clock, the little Chinese ladies come out and um, they hear this familiar phrase, yet man yet bao, that means one dollar, one bag. And there's one thing that unites Chinese through the years and it's all um, the fact that we all love a good bargain. Uh, just as a heads up, we're just a couple of minutes away from winding up. This is, I'm just gonna give the last section here. Uh, so please do add your, uh, your comments in the chat room or your questions in the Q&A box uh, because we'll be getting to those in just a couple of minutes. Uh, so small family businesses are really the lifeblood of Chinatown's economy. And I don't think there's anyone that I've ever met who is more entrepreneurial, harder working or determined uh, than this woman, 82 year old Tane Chen, who founded, owns and operates the walk shop on Grant Street. And even during the COVID shutdown, uh, I've talked to her several times, She's still working six or seven days a week handling online orders, which is what's keeping the lights on for her store. Very fortunate for her. Uh, she set up an online uh, business a couple of years before COVID hit and has been able to continue to serve customers, uh, not at the same level, but uh, uh, key, as I say, keep the lights on and keep the business going. Uh, there's a whole variety of, of small businesses and as you would expect, because Chinatown needed to be self-sufficient, uh, to be resilient and to survive. Uh, so you have everything from uh, an herbalist, uh, which you see here, uh, florist shop, seen here, uh, studio photographer. Uh, uh, this gentleman, by the way, uh, fascinating to stop in his shop. He has pictures of I think half a dozen presidents, governors, dozens of movie stars, other people who have visited uh, Chinatown who, whom he's photographed. Um, an acupuncturist, we were able to visit him, go back, uh, in our, uh, back behind the, <laughs> the front of the offices to, to where they prepared some of the herbs and, and I kept some of the herbs uh, and uh, it was quite fascinating. Here you see him with his mannequin with all of the uh, key points for acupuncture. Uh, there are other small businesses that cater especially to uh, tourism. And of course, they're now being hurt the worst. Uh, so uh, in addition to ones like the walk shop that I mentioned, uh, you have, uh, uh, there's a couple of gourmet tea tasting rooms. Uh, you have the traditional jade carvings boutiques, which catered very heavily to tourists. And just like in the restaurant sector where you see some emerging, uh, you know, more modern upscale contemporary uh, style restaurants, you're also seeing the same in some of the shops. Uh, this is actually the gift shop at China Live. Uh, and the uh, co-owner of China Live, uh, Cindy Chen, uh, here is the one that set up the gift shop. She traveled all around the world, especially to China, but also Europe and elsewhere, uh, gathering what she thought were some of the best products uh, in regard to design and, uh, and, and food and uh, has them for sale there in the gift shop. It's a terrific place uh, to buy some very high quality, unique gifts. Uh, another modern uh, uh, shop is this one which sells uh, silk clothing and it's called uh, Kim Plus Ono, uh, which is a play on the word uh, kimono, of course. Uh, and I think in this next shot, you see uh, some of the rack of some of the hand painted uh, silk uh, clothing. And the young woman here, they were holding a uh, a crazy rich Asians dress up day for the moon festival. So that's why she's uh, decked out like that. And the final image that I'd like to close with is uh, this shot, which is also the back cover of the book. Uh, and the reason that uh, I like this and our publisher did, and Kathy did, <laughs> we all sort of love this image. It's a really simple one. It's a mural, it's a photograph of a mural. It's in a back hall of a new, uh, 
a restaurant called Dim Sum Corner. And what we liked about it is it's, uh, we think representative of sort of the new Chinatown going forward. You've got this very contemporary young woman with a modern camera uh, and uh, here she is wearing a very traditional red dress, but uh, just the pose and the, uh, uh, the style of this, uh, we think uh, represents sort of a confidence going forward and a blending of the new generation and a look back at tradition. So we'd be delighted now to take your uh, questions. I see we've gotten a number of them. Uh, by the way, I might just mention here is the book website, uh, which has a lot of information, more photos, more stories, uh, and also uh, has a tab from which you can order uh, the book. Uh, so uh, I know, Dave, you've been monitoring, I think, uh, the Q&A. Um, yeah, I, I am monitoring it. I, I seem to can't get the video to um, come back up. So I, oh, can, you okay, well, me? can you hear I, me? Yeah. Oh, your video. Yeah. I can't get my video on. So um, anyway, I'll just go through the oh, questions there you today. Go. Um, Laura ex got excellent, you back up. excellent presentation, uh, Dick and Kathy. I wanted to just make a general comment that I'm going through the book and the this beautiful presentation and the work that you both contributed so extensively on. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that not only is the photography so beautifully composed and documenting this beautiful culture and the the text and the stories, Kathy, that you are um, really gifting this this. Uh, collaborative project is just really eloquent and really, really excellent. I wanted to tell you hats off for such an amazing job of capturing the essence and also sharing the culture. I think that's a very, very important thing that we are all feeling today as far as understanding and communication and appreciation of each other on this this global planet that we all share. And I think you've done you've done something that's not only just beautiful, but you've done something that's really historical and also something that's very social, um, socially um, very conscious and very, very proactive. So thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. Um, I don't know if, can you guys see the questions too, we, Kathy? Yes, I, I can. I'll take the first one and then maybe you guys can jump in and take the second and third. There's one here from Melina that says, must be to Dick, it says, is the photography digital, Dick? Yes, uh, the uh, Sony A7 is a digital mirrorless uh, DSLR. And uh, uh, I've been shooting digital probably since about 2007 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to shoot all film before that. There's a, second there's a second question here is, how is San Francisco's Chinatown um, surviving during the pandemic from Caillou? I'll take that one. Um, there, it is struggling severely. A lot of the restaurants have closed. Um, many are doing takeout and even that's not covering their expenses. But what you can do if you're still watching us is go on our website, chinatownbooksf.com. I wrote an article seven different things you can do to support Chinatown. And one of them is go online and uh, purchase things from um, different vendors in Chinatown that do have online sales, such as the walk shop, such as China Live. And you can do, um, encourage your company, if you work downtown, um, get a big giant takeout order for the whole staff, <laughs> the whole department, and um, go down there and even take a tour. Tours are available. So do support it. It is struggling. Oh, that's a great that's a great point, Kathy. I wanted to add to I don't know which restaurants are up and running, but obviously hearing that the Far East Cafe has shut its doors at the end of December was really just heart crushing um, because I know it was such a community focal point in the in that neighborhood in that community. I know I've, I've gone there for many, many, many years with very fond memories. So it was just like ripping out a memory out of one's memory book. Um, I'm hoping it can reopen, but I, my, my point would be 
Um, is there a listing of which restaurants are still in operation for takeout and that kind of thing with any online resources that are consolidating these restaurants that are, are open for folks? There, yeah. there is a list I know that, uh, uh, and I don't know the, the website right now, but there, there is a list uh, that's been put together by, uh, with help of the Chinese Culture Center and also the uh, restaurants in Chinatown. Uh, I think, awesome. uh, yeah, I think a little bit of uh, sleuthing looking for <laughs> Chinatown takeout restaurant, <laughs> you'll probably come across that list. Okay, uh, I want to say, of, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say a couple that I know are open because I've, uh, I've used them. <laughs> One is Dim Sum Corner. Uh, what I mentioned that uh, the back of the book mm -hmm. is actually a photo from there. Uh, and it's on uh, California and Grant. Uh, and it's a very uh, quite modern, uh, uh, with all kinds of dim sum. Uh, and you can go online and you know, uh, order and, uh, of course, pick up, or I suppose use some of the delivery services. Uh, China Excellent. Live, I know, is open. Uh, they have quite an extensive menu. Kathy, do you know of others that you've used? I think Far East Bakery, for sure. Yeah, a lot of the little bakeries are still open, like uh, uh, AA Bakery on uh, Stockton, Stockton and Far East Bakery. Go there for some treats, Yum Yum Bakery. Um, so if you walk through the bakeries, those little bakeries are still open. And um, Fortune Cookie Factory, still open. And right. a lot of these delis are still open. Uh, the Chinatown residents themselves are going there because they've always been going there anyway because they don't have cars and they, they frequent those places, but they need us, they need us to go there. That's good to know. I wanted to thank Melina for a question regarding the, is it digital or is it uh, not digital? The third question, why don't you take Dick um, or Kathy um, from Elena. It's about her favorite restaurant is in Clement for Din Sum. I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I did see it, but uh, yeah, lots well, yeah, let me comment on- I'm, I'm uh, not hearing, I'm sorry. There's a plane going right over my house. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me turn uh, off. Let me just mention Clement Street because uh, Clement, for those who don't know it, is not in Chinatown. Of course, it's in uh, the Richmond. Uh, but it is one of numerous, what I would call satellite Chinatowns, uh, quite a concentration um, of uh, ethnically Chinese and other Asians living there. Uh, a number of restaurants, uh, some large grocery stores carrying all of the ingredients similar to what you'd find on Stockton Street in Chinatown. Uh, and one thing we discovered as, as we did, or I did, Kathy probably knew this, but uh, you know, you have physical Chinatown, which is tiny in a way, uh, although very dense. And then you have virtual Chinatown, which is the whole Bay Area where you have uh, uh, other pockets where you have concentrations and, and uh, uh, as I say, at, uh, restaurants like you have in, in Clement. Uh, I know there's a martial arts studio there because I took some photos there. Uh, they have a festival just like you do in Chinatown. Uh, and, and so there's a much broader community that is supportive of Chinatown. People may own property there, have businesses there, have relatives there, go there for events. Uh, so it's really the, the cultural center uh, and the culture is much bigger than that small physical footprint of Chinatown. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you, Dick. Um, we have uh, some, Thomas is writing in from Austria, actually, who's listening in. Um, so we're reaching a global audience today. That says this question is for Dick. Can you read that? Good evening from Austria. I'd like to ask two questions, yeah. if I may. Are you interested? Are you also interested in the historical photographic depiction of a Chinatown? And did you, did you do any research in this field before you started this project? Uh, I did some research, yeah. There's, a, there's quite a good uh, book written on the history of Chinatown published, uh, oh, I think probably 15 years ago uh, by Phil Choi. Uh, and that was a very good reference for us here. Um, of course, as we started this project, uh, we knew we needed contacts within Chinatown. 
uh, so uh, uh, we had the Chinese Culture Center, but then I also uh, contacted Ben Fong Torres, who some of you may know quite well known as the original editor for 20 years of Rolling Stone magazine, and now a journalist and a writer and a broadcaster in the Bay Area. Uh, and he had worked with me previously on the Haight-Ashbury book. So uh, he was very eager to help. He was tied up and couldn't do much on his own, but he gave me contacts with quite a number of people uh, who you know, helped us. Uh, and as Kathy mentioned, uh, as we developed our contacts and explained what we were doing, we were able to get access inside you know, the family associations, inside the kitchens, inside the shops, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, even inside the old uh, shut down theater. There's a, a grand old theater that's closed, movie theater, uh, right in Chinatown boarded up. It was really an interesting experience to go inside that. The seats are still in place. Some of the old posters are still up. Uh, I'd love to see, I'd love to see shots of that myself. That sounds very fascinating. Yeah, we were, we were offered uh, from other photographers, some historical uh, photographs of which uh, we actually, we did use a few uh, and you'll see some on our website. I don't think we used any in the book. We used some on the website, uh, particularly uh, around some of the uh, Chinese in the military in World War II. Uh, quite interesting. And, Beautiful. And this, go ahead. Yeah, and we also, I think, uh, we certainly had some of some of the architecture. Uh, we did not go into depth, you know, specifically to Thomas's question about uh, you know, trying to do a comparison of the historical uh architecture and some of the great old photographs that are out there i've seen some of those and if you look at uh grand avenue today compared to those you see some of the same buildings <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. you see the same pagodas uh they've maybe been repainted a few times and spruced up but uh the shape is the same it's still there mm -hmm. the lights are beautiful most uh, i don't know if they're they're restoring them. I know. I know. When I talked to Fred Lyon when he was photographing Chinatown, he said a lot of times they were refitting and refabricating some of those antique lanterns and lighting fixtures because they were, of course, so weathered. Right. So, um, there's a second question for Kathy from Thomas. It says Kathy, is there anything that you miss from Chinatown, the Chinatown of your childhood, that's not there anymore? Yes, I have um, sites sounds and food and taste. Uh, the site of um, the Orange Land, there was this on the corner of uh, Stockton and one of the corner streets was this always this like five foot stack of oranges and the place was called Orange Land and you would, everyone would, would see it. And you would always wonder how did they stack these oranges so big? Well, that's gone. Um, another thing I miss seeing um, was the experience of going to a Chinese movie theater. We would always go in the evening, every weekend for a double feature, you'd watch a Kung Fu uh, movie and it would be followed by some modern tear jerking uh, Chinese drama. And there were like five or six different theaters we would choose from. And then the third thing I miss um, are certain cafes that are no longer. I remember Uncle's Cafe, they had this $2 apple pie that was the best apple pie. And then the Pinyin Cafe that also closed and it had this peach tart in a little tin with a crust and that peach tart rimmed with um, whipped cream was always my favorite as a child so there's these food <laughs> memories that are gone and um, truly miss it. Somebody yeah. had a question about Khan's restaurant I think in here and uh, uh, I don't know how many on the call remember Khan's K-A-N apostrophe S I think it was uh, but I remember going there and taking uh, like out of town business visitors there in the 70s. And I think even up through the 80s and then it closed. Uh, and we didn't have it in the slideshow, but we do have some photos of the paintings that were inside Gons uh, that have now been acquired by the Chinese Historical Museum. And that itself is quite a story of how they track these down. Uh, I think, uh, Kathy, you remember one was found in a garage car garage, I think, just on the wall. Uh, but uh, 
yeah, Khan's was a great restaurant. Uh, I remember that. And that's where we would take, uh, if we wanted to take people for a really good Chinese meal, that's where we would take them. Uh, if we wanted more of a celebration, we would go to uh, Empress of China, which was for birthdays. And I remember taking our grade school age daughters in there for birthdays and stuff. There's a question here. I don't know. It's probably for either Dick or Kathy or both. It says from JT, it says, would you or anyone offer a tour, a photo tour of Chinatown? but not just a tourist tour, but for photography. And I'll, I'll answer it first before I turn it over. We've offered many, many day and night photo workshops in Chinatown um, and in North Beach actually with Harvey Mug Photo Center. Um, we hope to bring those back um, with the very tight parameters of safety with the health and safety of our uh, city's uh, restrictions that are set up because of COVID and safety. So that is on the burner for hopefully the day then we can plug that back in. So um, I don't know if you're up for that, Dick, with all your experience and Kathy photographing it, but maybe we can, we can segue this into another um, photo tour project down the road into the future. Sure, we could certainly talk about it. I know also there's a couple photographers. Uh, one is Frank Jang, who is who you may know, who's in Chinatown does a lot of the uh, uh, local photography for events like Miss Chinatown or Moon Festival, all kinds of things. And then, uh, I'm sorry, I don't recall the name of the gentleman that we saw, uh, the photographer, professional photographer there that has the studio as well. Is he still there, the gentleman with the studio that photographed? As near as I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I, I'm sure the pandemic has affected him, but, uh, I would guess that he's still there, yeah. There's a question here for either Kathy or um, Dick from Ken. It says, any info about the barber June who played his uh, air, air ho in Ross Alley? I'm not sure if anyone can, there, you guys want to pick that up? I, do you know anything about that? I, I don't, there is a, uh, there is a barber right next to the, uh, Fortune cookie factory. Right. Uh, I don't know if there's any link there. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you do have some street musicians. Right. You do All have some time. shots of street musicians usually on Grant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I walk Grant at night sometimes way back and it, there's always music wafing yeah. through the street, which is really beautiful. Uh, question from an anonymous attendee. It says, will this presentation be available online? We will have this uh, link up on our Harvey Mutt Photo Center website today. So that will be available probably in a couple days. Um, and several people have asked that question. There's another question here about how do you, from Clay that says, how do you all see the central subway and resulting gentrification affecting Chinatown? Uh, why don't you go first, Kathy, and then I'll, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, the central subway project has really hurt um, business quite a bit on Stockton. Um, but you know, the locals continue to support Stockton Street because that's where all the produce is. That's where they get their chicken and, you know, raw pork. Um, but it's really discouraged a lot of tourists from even walking up there because there's just so much going on or not going on right now. Yeah. Um, it's just been really difficult because they've been delay after delay after delay. So it's kind of been this embarrassment for Chinatown and the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you go back to the reason for that project, uh, those who've been around for a number of decades will remember in, I think it's sort of the 87, 89 earthquake, the Loma Prieta. Uh, before that, there was a freeway, that, uh, the Embarcadero Freeway that came over what is now the Embarcadero and came right in at Broadway, right next to Chinatown. And that was an artery to come in and out of Chinatown. So you had a freeway that dropped you right in Chinatown. And uh, for uh, Chinese who maybe had moved out of Chinatown or relatives had moved out, uh, it was pretty easy to get into Chinatown and to get to Stockton Street and the shops and, and so on. Uh, so when that freeway was taken down, uh, then later there was a big concern about ability for 
people to access Chinatown. So the impetus to do that project had a good intention in mind was to make it easier to access mm -hmm. Chinatown via the BART system. Right. And right. unfortunately, it's taken, you know, it's taken much longer than planned, much more expensive, much more disruptive. <clears throat> and, you know, I think when it's finally completed, it's going to be appreciated and used. Uh, but it has been very disruptive during this period. I can imagine. So there's a question here for maybe Kathy. It says, is the Eastern Bakery still open to your knowledge? Yes, it's open every day. And if you go there, the owner will be outside um, welcoming you to not come in, but to order, he'll right. give you a menu. It is active, active, active every day. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. There's a question here from Michelle that says, how did you two come together to collaborate on this project? How did you choose sites within Chinatown to actually photograph? I'll let Kathy take the first and I'll take the second. Okay. I wrote a story about Chinatown for the New York Times in uh, 2018. And Dick's uh, wife saw the article in the New York Times and uh, he collaborated with the Chinese Culture Center to find that writer. And somehow they find me, I don't know how they did, but they got my personal email and uh, asked me if I wanted to collaborate on this project with Dick. And I thought it was a spam call, so I almost didn't answer it. <laughs> but, um, but I did answer it and we, we met up and um, Dick had a great vision and it really resounded um, with my heart for Chinatown and wanting to reconnect with it. And so we had uh, people at the Chinese Culture Center who did intros. We had a consultant, Mei Leong, who also had connections. You have to have connections within Chinatown. You can't just barge into these places. There's a lot of suspicion because uh, Chinatown people have been through so much. And uh, you know, you, you really have to earn people's trust. And we were very fortunate to be able to get in. Dick, what are your, your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I, mean, I echo all of that. And in terms of how we chose what to photograph, um, we, of course, we consulted some people as we developed contacts. So uh, I met with several, uh, you'd call, I guess, leaders, you'd call them like Betty Louie, who owns a lot of real estate and uh, has deep connections to uh, uh, Chinatown. I met with her, had lunch with her. And I, I just asked her, you know, what is important to represent about Chinatown? Uh, so, you know, she started talking about, well, restaurants and then <laughs> shops and then uh, organizations and then, uh, uh, and then as I would talk to others, I would ask them and, and I used the mission book as an example. So often I would show that to people and say, this is what we did for the mission. And, uh, you know, we, we tried not to uh, sugarcoat it or just photograph, you know, the nice things. We want to show the real Chinatown like we showed the real mission. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we're not out to be a muckraker either and show just the bad side. Uh, so we, we want to show the SROs. Uh, we want to talk about gentrification, uh, you know. So uh, as I would talk with people, they would come up with ideas uh, they would say, oh, you really need to include an herbalist, for example, or acupuncture, or uh, you need to go to the Chinese Historical Museum and photograph that mural. Uh, that's the background of uh, Kathy's, uh, her virtual screenshot there. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we would meet people, we would ask them, you know, what else? And we kept getting terrific ideas from people at all walks of life, really. Uh, so so and, really list, listening to who you were interviewing sort yes. of led you the way. That's, that's excellent. Um, there's a question here from an anonymous attendee today. It says, did you photograph any of Chinatown's most iconic bars and any good stories to share behind some of those, Lai Po or Buddha Lounge? They're so cool looking. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, I have a couple shots of Buddha Lounge. Like That's the second book. That's the second book. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like the door. Uh, so I had some photos, but you know, at the end of the day, when we were looking for the 200 photos out of 5,000, uh, 
right. uh, which the publisher helped with. Uh, you know, it didn't make the the cut. We I was going to ask that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to say we have stories on our website about kind of the era of the lounges and heyday and nightlife of Chinatown from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And uh, there were many lounges and um, dance halls, and that was a really glamorous time for mm -hmm. Chinese performers that um, sounded like uh, Bing Crosby and danced like Fred Astaire. So there was that time when Shanghai Low was part of it. Um, people would go afterwards to the Buddha lounge. My own father-in-law would, um, while well, my mother-in-law went shopping, he hung out at all the different lounges. So <laughs> that's kind of a family no-no thing to share. <laughs> <laughs> We're letting out all the skeletons today. <laughs> There's, a, there's one from Judy that says, I truly enjoyed listening. It was very educational. Thank you so much for sharing. One from Lillian who said, great Chinatown photos. I'd love to purchase this book. Thank you, Harvey Mott Photo Center for offering this virtual program. Um, also a question here from May Choi says, can you tell us about Johnny Can's Shanghai Low restaurants? Uh, I don't know if you can. Johnny, uh, Johnny Khan's and Shanghai Low restaurants. Mm -hmm. Well, Khan's was one of the uh, preeminent Chinese restaurants with the tablecloths and um, a lot of movie stars went there. My own aunt and uncle got married there, had a reception yeah. there. So it was an upstairs restaurant and um, now is no longer, but uh, hopefully we're gonna see the resurrection of banquet lounges again and glamorous nightlife. Let's just all hope for that. Hope for the best, right? Right. And Here's there, what are, says. there are murals, uh, or paintings right. from Khan's at the Chinese Historical Society Museum. Right, right. The are they open now or are they closed still right now? They're, they're closed. Um, here's one for Richard. How many years did you spend photographing Chinatown? When did you begin? Um, and when did you begin to know it would result in a book from Donald? Uh, well, I'm in. In answer to the second question, uh, I started photographing on the basis of doing a book. Mm. Uh, you know, having done Hate Ashbury and having done the mission. Um, so I had sort of a template, particularly from the mission project. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to, for frame of reference, the mission book took me three years. Uh, the Chinatown book was more like two or two and a half from the time of starting. I did have some photographs from as much as 10 years earlier, just mm -hmm. as a tourist walking around Chinatown. And a few of those actually made it into the book as well. But most of the shots were taken in uh, 2018 and 2019 with a few in the last quarter of 2017. Just going through these questions here, there's, uh, I wanna make sure we covered most of them. Um, let's see here. Um, not sure if this is a question for us or for our city supervisors. <laughs> it says uh, from Caillou, it says, does your city government, does the city government or district supervisor do, that, do anything to help Chinatown? I'm assuming that would be a yes question. To what extent? I'm not uh, equipped to answer that question. <laughs> um, let's hope that there is support with all of our neighborhoods in the beautiful city to support all the cultures uh, adequately, especially in this time of real struggle um, with the restaurants and the businesses, the bakeries, the gift shops, um, like you mentioned um, before. I'm, I'm amazed. I've been in that walk shop up on, it's on Grant, correct? Yep. And that, that's, uh, I think I've seen that lady in there several times when I purchased walks way back in the day. So um, she's wonderful, just really hardworking. Um, very outspoken too. If you ask her, very, yeah, very which, opinionated. Which is better, the uh, the spun walk from Hayward or the cast walk from China? She'll give right. you <laughs> right. a clear opinion. She'll give and, you her best. Yeah, and on the note of what is the city doing, Aaron Peskin is its um, business supervisor, and he's been involved with Chinatown for about. 20 years now, he really cares. And he, he did take us on a tour of Chinatown and SROs as well. Um, so he, they have his ear. It, it's not like nobody in San Francisco um, in leadership cares about Chinatown. They, you know, Aaron Peskin has really um, 
you know, he's learned some Cantonese to raise a toast, <laughs> knows people there, and um, he's involved. So I don't think you have to feel like Chinatown is being abandoned by the city. At least he and um, is really working hard. And you have the many nonprofits. There's at least 200 nonprofits that at least have an arm in Chinatown. So there's a lot of community support, but it all comes down to money, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it makes things go round. There's one here from an earlier question we had uh, from Michelle. It says her favorite food was sticky rice wrapped with banana leaves. Sorry, I don't know the name of it. So maybe maybe you know the name of it, Kathy. It's called Jung. J Sounds delicious. Sounds delicious. Actually, I'm getting hungry while I'm reading through some, through some of these. I'd like to have a, uh, one of those fabulous cakes from the Eastern uh, Bakery. <laughs> With a cup of coffee, that would be great about Oh now. my gosh, be so great. Wouldn't that be great? We could have a virtual uh, coffee party. Oh, we should, party. next time. We should just do that like the next cream, time. Cream some um, slide show. Just, just, I yeah. just saw a question here uh, that I think might be interesting. It said, it seems that Grant Avenue is for tourists with all of its souvenir shops and locals shop on Powell or Stockton Street. Uh, I think that's exactly correct uh, in our uh, Grant is more tourists, but I mean, you see a lot of locals on Grant too. Uh, and Stockton is pretty much locals. Uh, and it does, and it does support, I mean, it does support the community. A lot of those shop owners are uh, families that live in the neighborhood, right? right. I mean, so yeah. it does support, it is supported by tourist dollars for, um, it supports the community. Um, there's a question here. It says, any plans for the next San Francisco <laughs> book? Of course, Dick and I, we've talked about this recently. <laughs> well, uh, I've gotten quite a few questions like that as we've done these book talks. So, uh, you know, what I would love to hear is from uh, uh, people, if you just put what you think neighborhood would be good. That's basically how I chose the mission. And then how I chose Chinatown after that was feedback uh, from people who had read the book and said, oh, it'd be really great if you did the mission or did Chinatown. By the way, those books are all available still in print with the Chinatown book, the Haight-Ashbury yeah. and the mission. Yeah, uh, Haight-Ashbury may be a bit more limited, uh, but uh, all of them are listed on Amazon. I mean, uh, Chinatown book is in all the stores in San Francisco today, it, as well as being on Amazon. Uh, the mission is still, I think, in most uh, bookstores. Um, SF MoMA carries it. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you just Google, uh, you know, Chinatown book, sf.com, uh, we have uh, an order tab where you can see a number of suggested places to order that they have links directly. It's a beautiful book too. I want to say that again. It's a really gorgeous historical um, collection of work. In the essence of time, I'll take one or two more and we're pushing to three o'clock now. So uh, Melina says, thank you for a very impressive book. I appreciate your passion and all the histories behind the photos. Um, says, as usual, the Harvey Milk and the director of Photo Center Excels. Thank you, Melina, for that. Um, another one from Noreen says, do you have anything on Dragon a go-go on Wentworth Alley during the 60s? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy? <laughs> Next one, part two. Any stories behind that one? <laughs> um, let's see, I wanna make sure we've hit them all. I think we've got most of them. Um, but I wanted to thank, thank you both again, Dick Evans and Kathy Jin Leong. You did, you've done such an amazing collection and piece here, which is again, historical for our city and the community. And again, I think, I think it bridges not only photography with many of the, the folks that were on today or our photographers in our arena and our audience, but I also think it really, it reaches a sort of a social and historical um, connection that layers that sandwich so beautifully. And I think, again, um, 
in photography, you know, in any art form, it's a sense of communication and furthering one's knowledge, one's appreciation for beauty, culture, um, points of view, you know, um, and, and I think it, you've just done an exemplary job. So hats off to you. Thank you, uh, Laura, for being part of, of this as well today. And I'm so happy we were able to host this today. And, and we'll be in conversation with both Dick and Kathy for the uh, maybe the next book that we can help <laughs> host. Um, it's been a really enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. Stay safe. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, and please stay safe. And thank you for joining us today. Happy New Great. Year. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye now.